Welcome to this first lecture about linear mixed effects models, where I will introduce the concept with a simple example. In the next video, we'll have a look at a more advanced model. Mixed effects models are called mixed because they include both fixed and random effects. Fixed effects represent things like the population mean that do not vary. These may represent population parameters that we like to estimate in for example linear regression. Random effects represent parameters that can vary between groups of dependent data points. For example, if we do several measurements on the same individual, the mean of these measurements can represent one estimated parameter. Each individual will then have a unique estimate. So, let's have a look at an example where four persons have tried a certain diet. These are the weights in kilos before the diet whereas these are the weights after one and two weeks on the diet. Let's plot the data. These three data points represent the weights of person number one, and these represent the data for person number two, and so forth. Suppose that we like to estimate the overall weight loss per week. We therefore use linear regression and fit the regression line to the data. The intercept of this line has been estimated to 89.875, which represents the estimated population mean weight before starting the diet. The slope has been estimated to negative 3.125, which means that the average weight loss per week is about 3.1 kilos. We now like to know if the weight change per week is significantly different from zero. In other words, can we reject another hypothesis that states that the slope is equal to zero, which means that the diet has no effect? If you use the software, we can see that the p-value associated with the slope is 0 0.372. Since this p-value is bigger than the general significance level of 0 0.05, we do not reject another hypothesis and conclude that the slope is not significantly different from zero. This means that the diet does not significantly reduce the weight per week, which seems a bit strange, because all four individuals clearly reduce their weights over time. However, if instead we would have used a linear mixed effects model, the p-value would have been less than 0 0.001, and we would have rejected the null hypothesis and concluded that the slope is significantly lower than zero. So, how can there be such a big difference in the p-values between the simple linear regression model and the linear mixed effects model? When we use simple linear regression, the data points are very far away from the line. This is simply due to the fact that the four individuals that were randomly selected from the population had different weights. However, we do not care about the weights of the four persons before they start the diet because we are in fact only interested in how much their body weights change over time. To deal with the fact that we have variations in body weights between the individuals, which is irrelevant in this case, and that we have variance within the cases, we can use a linear mixed effects model where the subjects are treated as random effects, so that we can estimate the intercept and slope for each individual. By using a linear mixed effects model, can be seen as we fit lines to each subject or item. In this case, I have used a model with random intercepts and a fixed slope. We can think of this model as all individuals in the population are assumed to have the same slope, where we estimate the population slope based on the four subjects. This might seem unrealistic because different individuals will lose weight at different rates. However, to keep things simple, we here estimate just one slope for all individuals. In the next video, we'll include also a random slope. Since we use a model with random intercepts, each individual will now have its own intercept. If you use a statistical software, we can extract these kinds of values from the output, which are called random effects. These values tell us how far away the intercept of each person is from the overall intercept. For example, person number 1 has an intercept that is 11.2 bigger than the overall intercept. This means that the estimated intercept of the first person is about 101. Similarly, the estimated intercept of the second person is about 95, and so forth. Note that the mean of the four intercepts 
corresponds to the overall intercept. Based on these four equations, we can draw the dashed lines that can be seen as individual regression lines for each individual. The advantage is that the data points are now much closer to the lines, which will result in a much smaller standard error and therefore a smaller p-value. The sum of the squared residuals is only 11.9, compared to 896 in the case where we only have one regression line, because the data points are much further away from the line. The variance of the data points around their corresponding lines is much smaller compared to the variance around the overall regression line. So, why do we call this a mixed effects model? It is called mixed because we include both fixed effects and random effects. The differences from the overall intercept can be seen as a random variable, where we assume that these values are randomly distributed with a mean of zero and a variance that is estimated by the model. Since we assume that only the intercepts vary between the individuals, this is called a random intercept model. This makes sense, because if we would collect random individuals from a certain population, we expect that the distribution of the body weights would follow a normal distribution. We'll now compare the output of a multiple linear regression model, where we have included the subjects as a factor, with a mixed effects model, where the subjects are treated as a random factor. This notation means that the subjects have random intercepts. We'll discuss these notations a lot more in the second video. Note that the factor subjects in the linear regression model is treated as a fixed effect, because we now like to compare exactly these four individuals. The four individuals are no longer seen as random subjects from the population. If we use both a multiple linear regression model and a linear mixed effects model, we'll get the following estimates from the two models. Note that both models have the same slope but different intercepts. The intercept of the multiple linear regression model represents the intercept of the baseline category, which in this case happens to be person number one. Whereas the intercept in the mixed effects model is the overall intercept, which is the mean intercept of the four individuals. These values for person number two, three and four represent how far away the estimated intercepts are from the intercept of the baseline category. For example, the estimated intercept of person number 2 is 6 kilos lower compared to person number 1, and the estimated intercept of person number 3 is 18 kilos lower compared to person number 1, and so forth. In comparison, the random effects in the mixed effects model tell us how far away the intercept of each subject is from the overall mean. For example, this value tells us that person number 1 has an intercept that is about 11.2 kilos bigger than the overall mean. Note that the multiple linear regression model does not give us an overall intercept. Also, we violate the assumption of independence in the case when we use multiple linear regression, since the observations are not independent, because for example these three data points come from the same person. We should therefore use a linear mixed effects model when we deal with repeated measurements. We'll now have a look at the differences between a linear mixed effects model and a repeated measures ANOVA. Note that I have a video about repeated measures ANOVA on my homepage. There are several advantages with linear mixed effects models compared to repeated measures ANOVAs. With the linear mixed effects model, we can estimate coefficients such as the slope. Another advantage is that a linear mixed effects model works fine with missing data, whereas a repeated measure ANOVA would delete all data points of the person with the missing data point, which reduces the sample size and the statistical power. Also, ANOVA assumes that the dependent variable is continuous. In comparison, a generalized linear mixed effects model can be used on, for example, binary outcomes, or if the dependent variable represents counts, that we have discussed in previous videos. In repeated measures ANOVA, the repeated measures must be a categorical variable, which means that the time points for the measurements must be the same for all individuals. In comparison, 
a linear mixed effects model works just fine if the independent variable is also on continuous scale, which means that the time points do not have to be the same for the measurements. Note that the assumptions for a linear mixed effects model are basically the same as for linear regression, which means that for example the explanatory variables should be linearly related to the response variable and that the residuals are normally distributed. Suppose that the data would show a non-linear pattern like this. Then it would not make sense to fit straight lines to the data. However, we could still use a repeated meshes ANOVA to check if there is a significant difference in the means between the time points. Finally, note that in the special case where we only have two measurements on the same subject, the linear mixed effects model with random intercepts will result in the exact same p-value as the repeated meshes ANOVA and the pair t-test, but only if the repeated measurements have a positive correlation like in this case. A linear mixed effects model actually assumes that the observations within the cluster are positively correlated. In the next lecture we'll see how we can include also random slopes, and how to add an additional factor to analyze if there is an interaction between two factors. We'll also see how to compute a linear mixed effects model with R and SPSS. See you in the next lecture and thanks for watching.